Hey everyone, thanks for coming on short notice. Um, so there's there's two uh, things I wanted to talk about uh, today, um, and uh, I'll start off with uh, the, uh, the the landing of the the boost stage. So I'm happy to confirm um, that the, the, the we were able to land do a soft landing of the Falcon 9 boost stage uh, in the Atlantic, um, and uh, uh, it, all the data that we received back shows that it did the soft landing and was in a, in a healthy condition uh, after that. Um, it, it, does it, it does look like it was, that the stage was subsequently destroyed by wave action, because um, the, the seas were very heavy, it was like 15 to 20 foot uh, seas. So um, we, we suspect the stage is, is, was destroyed due to the essentially stormy seas. But the, the data is very clear that it shows a soft landing. It shows deployment of all the legs, <coughs> and uh, that the stage was in a safe state uh, in the water. Um, we also have a, a a video feed, although the link was very weak. Uh, so for the video feed, we're trying to uh, clean the video feed up and try to have it be something that uh, where you can make sort of sense of it. Um, and we're going to clean it up as much as, as we can on the, the SpaceX side, and then we're going to post it on our website and sort of try to crowdsource, see if uh, people out there can actually make it uh, look uh, even better. Because I know that the people, people out there are really good at uh, fixing video streams. Um, so I think this, that's a really huge milestone for SpaceX and certainly for the space industry. Um, no one has ever soft landed uh, a liquid rocket boost stage before. Uh, and uh, I think this bodes very well for achieving reusability. As people have maybe heard me say, I think what what SpaceX has done thus far is evolutionary, but but not revolutionary. Um, and I think if if we can make um, if, if we can recover the stage intact and relaunch it, the potential is there for a truly revolutionary impact in space transport transport costs. Um, the cost of propellant is actually only about 0.3 percent of the cost of the rocket, so or, or of a mission. So, if a mission costs 60 million dollars. The cost of propellant is only 200 thousand dollars. So, there's the potential there for ultimately a hundredfold improvement in the cost of access to space. Um, so, I think with the information that we've learned from this flight, we know we can soft land the rocket. Um, and we're taking some additional steps with the upcoming flight, uh, which will be a commercial mission for uh, Orbcom, uh, to uh, have a much greater probability of getting to the stage in time and recovering it. So we're uh, securing much bigger boats this time, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, I think we try to get every, we call every boat owner on the East Coast above a certain size. And uh, it turns out most of the, the boats that can take really heavy seas are actually in the Gulf and uh, elsewhere, but not on, apparently not on, on the, uh, in the greater Florida area. So this time we're going to have uh, much more capable boats. And I think also uh, we, we kind of got unlucky that we essentially landed the stage in the middle of a big storm. Um, and so hopefully this time we will not have to do that. Uh, it, would also be, it would also be splashing down uh, or landing in the water uh, much closer to land than, than last time. So I think we hope we'll avoid some of the, the deep ocean stuff. Um, and then uh, at, with, with each successive launch, and we have several more launches this year, we expect to get more and more uh, precise with the landing. And if all goes well, um, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to land the stage back at Cape Canaveral by the end of the year. So that's all, all great stuff. And I think Assuming that happens, we should be able to, to refly the, the main boost stage sometime next year. Uh, anyways, it's somewhat of a huge day because we've been trying to do this at SpaceX for a long time, and it's been 12 years, and we've, we've sort of finally did it. Um, and uh, now we're just got to bring it back home in one piece. Uh, so any questions about, uh, about that? Yeah, we've actually uh, worked with uh, with Air Force Range Safety to I identify 
uh, several locations at Cape Canaveral uh, where, uh, where we can land the stage. Um, they've actually been really helpful. So uh, at first we were concerned, well, range safety might be, you know, <laughs> object to this. Uh, but they actually have been really helpful and supportive. And, um, and there, there are several places we, we can land. Um, it kind of depends on, on how tightly we can control the landing point. Um, and I think if, uh, if we can demonstrate tight control, there are actually a lot of places at the Cape that we can land. Uh, uh, Mike, sure. Alan Boyle with N NBC News. Okay. Elon, uh, was anything sighted or recoverable, or was there just nothing left that you could see when, when you tried to look for the stage? So the recovery operations were challenging because we, we actually couldn't get a boat out there for two days. The, we literally could not find anyone willing to go out there. We even called the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard wasn't willing to go out. Um, so uh, as soon as we could get out there was, was, like I said, two days later. We actually have been able to find pieces of the interstage. So that the interstage is the carbon fiber structure that joins the first and second stage. Um, and that, that's certainly something that you would expect to get destroyed by wave action because it's got a big open hole at the top and the waves will come in and kind of blow it apart. Um, so we've, we've recovered most of the interstage. Uh, we recovered a portion of one leg. Um, and, uh, and there were a bunch of other little bits and pieces. Uh, we've not recovered anything of the main um, aluminum lithium airframe. Hi, it's Frank Mooring with Aviation Week. Um, does your data show how close you got to your aim point? Yeah. And also, how many more attempts will you be able to have to get to that uh, target by the end of the year? Sure. So um, in this particular case, we were just trying to uh, get the rocket to go to uh, zero velocity at uh, the water, you know, at sea level. And we weren't trying very hard to get to a precise location. Um, nonetheless, we were within a few miles of our target, so I think that's uh, you know, pretty good. I think with a, you know, we could certainly tighten it up massively with, with a little bit of effort. What kind of CEP, what kind of target do you need? How close do you need to get to the heavy Air Force West to land there? Uh, probably we need to be comfortably in less than a one mile uh, radius error. Um, but I mean, in principle, we should be able to land with the accuracy of a helicopter, you know, literally, if, if you've seen the, the, the test flights of, of the rocket, you can see how, just how precise it is. I mean, it lands to within less than a meter of its target. Um, so, yeah. Hi, Dan Leone with Space News. Sort of along the same lines, how much longer is it appropriate or even helpful to continue doing the soft landing tests on the water? At some point, you won't be able to learn exactly what you need to know to do a recovery mm -hmm. doing that. Yeah, we'll only be doing the, the water uh, landings until we're confident that we can land with accuracy, um, and, uh, and then we'll be transitioning to land landing. Marcia Smith, SpacePolicyOnline.com. How many times do you expect to reuse each of these first stages, and what is your business model for how many launches you need per year in order to make reusability cost effective? So uh, our pricing, this, uh, our pricing mm -hmm. right now assumes no reusability. Um, so n none of our, our prices are contingent on that. Um, any reusability we're able to achieve would only allow us to uh, reduce prices from where they are today. Um, the, the, the more often we're able to fly and the more often we're able to reuse the stages and the less work they require between flights, the lower the, the cost can be. Um, the, the boost stage is roughly 70% of the cost of a launch. Um, so if we're able to reuse it and refly it with, with minimal uh, work between flights um, and customers are comfortable with that, and it might take a few years for customers to get comfortable with that, um, then, then obviously there's so a, as much as ultimately a 70% reduction from where things are today. Jeff Brumfield with National Public Radio. I know the official line was that this had, I think, slightly less than a 50-50 chance of working. Did you personally think it was going to work on the very first try? 
Well, it's not strictly speaking the very first try. Um, the, the the first time we tried to do a soft uh, ocean landing was uh, Falcon 9 Flight 6. Um, so it was about that was about eight months ago, and um, and that's where we had um, an issue. Just basically, the rocket spun spun up too much due to the high aerodynamic torque coming in through hyp from hypersonic velocity. Um, something we didn't expect was that uh, that even small changes, or, or even small um, asymmetries on the outer skin of the rocket would cause it to spin up because it's facing such high um, high forces. Uh, so the the, the uh, nitrogen thrusters on board the rocket uh, for, for that flight weren't able to overcome the aerodynamic torque. For this flight we just had, we, we doubled the, the thrust of the uh, the nitrogen thrusters. So uh, and, and also added a bunch more nitrogen uh, coal gas propellant. Did you, did you uh, you know, I gave it sort of a 40, 50 percent chance of working, um, and uh, yeah, so it, it I, 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 I was at that, that percentage, I think. Um, so I, I was actually positively surprised by the fact that the legs deployed, it landed, it sat, it's basically sat there for eight seconds before we lost data, um, and uh, that's a better outcome than, than I'd expected. Julia Piper with uh, Environment Energy Publishing. I know there are huge cost savings here. I wonder if you could talk about efficiency or material savings. Is there any sort of environmental or sustainability benefits coming with reusing these these rockets, fitting into your larger body of work? I'm thinking Tesla here and the benefits there. Sure. Um, well, there's no question. Uh, if com compared to the way that rocket flight normally works, where the uh, stages will, will just kind of come back and crash, and you know, there's a bunch of rocket stages at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, reusing the stages is, you know, much better for the environment, um, and, and it takes much less energy. Then so you don't have to keep rebuilding new rockets, and so I think it's, it's there's certainly a sustainability element there. Yeah. We have some reporters who are queued up on the phone. If you could give your name uh, and affiliation prior to asking your question. Thank you, sir. Our first question comes from the line of. I believe it's Mr. Keith King, and he's from CBS Set News. Please proceed. Great. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Uh, sure. Great. It's Peter King at CBS Radio News. Uh, just a, a quick yes-no question, and then uh, one that uh, might take a little longer. You know for sure, I just want to make sure I've got it straight, do you know for sure that it's soft-landed vertically? And uh, the second question is, how long do you anticipate it'll take you to turn around a spent first stage to be ready to fly again? Um, yeah, we we know uh, with certainty that it landed vertically with the legs deployed and in a essentially a nominal configuration. Um, is w we've got uh, the telemetry to show that. So and s there's multiple sources of telemetry. Um, we have sensors on each individual leg. Uh, we have multiple uh, inertial sensors um, and uh, GPS, uh, multiple uh, uh, GPS units on it, and they they all sort of agree with with that. Uh, uh, conclusion. Um, in terms of be uh, it being ready to for for reflight, uh, the if if, if if we were to recover the stage from the ocean, it would probably take a couple months to uh, refurbish it for flight. Um, however, for uh, stage landing on uh, land landing back on land near the launch site, in principle, we should be able to refly it the same day. So it's a huge difference. Um, and that's why we're, um, you know, really focused on trying to get it back to the launch site. That that's what would really make the the huge difference on reusability. I mean, obviously, w with the space shuttle, we had a case where there was a partially reusable vehicle, but um, the space shuttle was not neither rapidly nor completely reusable. Um, and in order to achieve um, a revolutionary improvement in the cost of space flight, it's got uh, any, any reusability has to be both rapid and complete. Next question from the phone, please. Thank you, sir. Our next question also happens to be a Mr. Bill Harwood from CBS News. Please go ahead, sir. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Musk, how far downrange uh, was the loft soft landing zone on this flight, 
And you mentioned a minute ago, uh, you know, taking a little time to get customers comfortable with uh, flying a rocket again that's already been flown. I can agree that might be a real hurdle to face, maybe more than the technical side. Can you talk a little bit about what you'll have to do to demonstrate to them that this is, in fact, a reliable way to fly? Thanks. Right, absolutely. I think what we'll have to do is is uh, do a demonstration reflight uh, without a, uh, an operational satellite on board. And if that demonstration reflight works, and some, some customers may want more than one, uh, then that's, that's the thing that would really ultimately convince them. Um, and then I should probably transition to uh, the, the other sort of uh, news item, uh, w which is, um, you know, not, not, not as, well, not, the first one was positive, this one was a bit negative. Um, the, the, the SpaceX has decided to file suit uh, and protest the, uh, EL, the Air Force ELV block by. Uh, this is a, a 36 core sole source uncompeted procurement that was signed earlier this year and that essentially blocks uh, companies uh, like SpaceX from competing for national security launches. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, essentially what, what we feel is that, um, that, that this, 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 is, this is not right, uh, that the uh, national security launches should be put up for competition and they should not be awarded on a sole source uncompeted basis. Um, and it, it just seems odd that if our vehicle is good enough for NASA and, and supporting a uh, hundred billion dollar space station uh, and it's good enough for uh, launching NASA science satellites, for launching uh, complex commercial geostationary satellites and really every every satellite you can imagine, it th there's no reasonable basis for it not being capable of launching something quite simple like a G GPS satellite. Um, so. This, this really doesn't seem right to us. Um, we've tried every, every uh, avenue to try to figure out you know, wh why is this the case? Is there anything we can do besides uh, file a protest? And, and it seems like we're, we're essentially left with the only option, which is, is to file a protest. Um, the, the ULA rockets are basically about four times more expensive than ours. so. This contract is costing the U.S. taxpayers billions of dollars of it for no reason. Uh, and w to sort of add salt to the wound, the primary engine used is a Russian main engine made, made in Russia. Um, and mo moreover, the, the person who's sort of heads up Russian space activities is um, Dmitry Rogozin, uh, who is on the sanctions list. Um, so it's, it seems pretty strange, like, you know, how is it that we're sending hundreds of millions of U.S. taxpayer money at a time when Russia is in the process of invading the Ukraine? Uh, and it would be hard to imagine some way that Dmitry Rogozin is not benefiting personally f from from the dollars that are being sent there. So on the, su on the surface of it, it appears that there's good probability of, of some sanctions violation uh, as well. And we think this deserves uh, to have a spotlight on it. And, uh, you know, let, let's yeah, let that sort of sunshine on this, and as I say, sunlight is the best disinfectant. And if everything's fine, then I guess that's great. But uh, that that seems unlikely to me. Go Questions? Ahead. Thank you. Um, Continuing on, we now. Oh, sorry. Please go ahead. <laughs> Um, is this protest happening through JAO? Is that uh, where you're filing at least first? And is it only being filed by SpaceX or any of your other competitors coming on board as well? Uh, it's being filed in the Court of Federal Claims. Um, and um, 
the, there may be others that that join, uh, but uh, thus currently it's it's just SpaceX. And and I, I want something I want to be uh, r real clear about: Th this is not SpaceX protesting and saying that there's these launches should be awarded to us. We're just pr protesting and saying these launches should be competed. Um, and if we compete and lose, that's fine. But why were they not even competed? And um, it's just that, that just doesn't doesn't make sense. I mean, there's you know we've heard statements about well, there's this like certification process. Like, um, okay, well, we're most of the way through that certification process. So far, there've been zero changes to the rocket. This is a paperwork exercise, um, and w w since this is a, a large multi-year contract, why not wait a few months for the certification process to complete, and then do the competition? That seems very reasonable to me. I'm Jonathan Salant over at Bloomberg News. Where are you in the certification process? I know you've had at least one flight approved. Uh, current flight now to the space station, is that another flight you're submitting for approval, and when do you expect to get full Air Force uh, approval to compete? Well, we've done, uh, technically we've done uh, n nine Falcon 9 flights. Um, of the exact configuration that the Air Force wants, we've done four. All four of them have completed uh, their, their mission. Uh, That they obviously worked. So, yeah. Uh, Aaron Meadow with Defense News. Um, have you informed the Air Force of uh, the fact that you're filing the suit, and are you at all concerned that this could damage your relationship with the service? Uh, we did inform the Air Force uh, just before this, uh, before the press conference. Um, and I mean, first of all, I should say, like, it's not as though we're, we're battling the whole Air Force. This is not, that's not the case at all. Um, I think uh, we're on very good terms with the vast majority of the Air Force. Um, our uh, concern really relates to a handful of people in the, in the procurement uh, area of the Air Force. Hi, Elon. I'm Pat Hose with Defense Daily. It seems one of the frustrations with the company is that the Air Force tells you to do one thing and then you're about to do it, but then they change the rules or perhaps move the goalposts on you. Can you cite some specific examples of how the Air Force has moved the goalposts on you on your quest to become qualified? Well, um, I, I guess the, the, the goalposts were certainly moved with respect to for, for, for SpaceX relative to when Boeing and Lockheed competed for the EELV contracts. Um, Boeing and Lockheed, that's before they merged their launch business into uh, United Launch Alliance, um, were awarded um, a, a large number of launches, I think maybe 30 or 40 launches under the ELV program before doing a single flight of, of the Atlas V or the Delta IV. Um, when SpaceX came along and said, hey, we'd like to compete, um, w we were told that we had to have uh, three flights of the exact configuration uh, that the Air Force would fly before they would allow us to compete. That seems like it's a bit like pulling up the drawbridge, you know, after, you know, it's not, not quite right. Um, but, but we did that. We actually did that. Um, and, and after we did the three launches and, and completed them, that's a month later, we, we were told, oh, uh, the Air Force has done a, a 30, you know, has done this huge uh, source force procurement, uncompeted uh, to Boeing and Lockheed. And we're like, but, but we, just, we just did the thing you asked us to do. Um, that seems pretty wrong. Um, yeah. I should also say this. You know, normally when there's a sole source, you know, a huge multi-billion dollar sole source procurement, there's a, a justification given. Uh, in this case, there was no justification uh, provided for, for this. Um. Uh, Whitney Bright, CBS News Path. Uh, just wanted to uh, change gears a little bit. Um, 
And talk, if you could talk a little bit about the potential Tesla plant. Oh, geez. No, I'm sorry. I can't answer Tesla questions. OK. Hi, Dan Leone with Space News again. For the national security business you envision doing, is it going to be mostly Falcon 9? Is it going to be mostly Falcon Heavy? And then on a side note, ULA has a great deal of what SpaceX calls subsidies in the form of support services contracts. Um, why wouldn't SpaceX, if not requiring the exact same thing, not have similar costs of doing business with the government that would drive up the prices? Yeah, so it would be, in terms of Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy, we think probably uh, it's something like two-thirds Falcon 9, one-third Falcon Heavy. Um, and in fact, uh, in, in our protest, we, we only are, are protesting launches that we could do. So we're not protesting launches we couldn't do. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to be as fair and reasonable as possible here. Um, and then with respect to the, the sort of, like, wouldn't our costs just be like, like their costs? Um, I, I don't know why their rockets are so expensive. They're insanely expensive. I mean, on the order of you know, $400 million flight, all things considered. So in, in our case, our commercial price is $60 million. Um, and uh, we, we expect roughly a $30 million increase due to Air Force mission assurance requirements. Um, and that seems to be bearing out. Um, so, so yes, it makes our rocket 50% more expensive, but it doesn't make it 400% you know, more expensive. Um, you know, I think we have the advantage that our rocket was designed and uh, designed in the factory was built in the 21st century, whereas Atlas V and Delta IV were designed in kind of the, the 90s, um, and in fact have a lot of legacy hardware that stretches back to the 70s and 80s, even before if you count the RL-10. So I think the fact that we have a new rocket design with new manufacturing techniques is very helpful for the cost. Um, I think we have a number of design innovations in, in the rocket that are also helpful for cost. Um, and um, yeah, and, and, oh, and it, th I mean, there's some of it's just like elementary things. Like if you look at the Atlas V, it uses three types of propellant. So it uses solid rocket motors, it uses a, a kerosene first stage and a hydrogen upper stage. Um, our rocket, our Falcon 9 by comparison, is a two-stage rocket. Uh, that both stages just use uh, rocket propellant grade kerosene. So r right off the bat to the first order approximation, our operation, operational cost in launch are a third of what an Atlas V would be. Hi, Yang Yang with Bloomberg Television. My question for you is in announcing this suit, you had at your question um, that you had just posed to the Air Force was why not wait a few months before awarding ULA the contract? Well, the Air Force awarded ULA the contract a few months ago, back in December. So why are you waiting to file this suit now? And secondly, another question is I just want to know if you come any closer to picking a state for <laughs> the first the first rocket launch pad. Oh, okay. So this is SpaceX related. Okay. You can answer those two. Thanks. Sure. So uh, w we actually only learned about the, uh, the, 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 30, the, the big sole source award uh, in March. So the, it may have been signed in December, but it only came to light, uh, interestingly, one day after the Senate hearing uh, on, on, on ELV launch costs, which seems remarkably coincidental uh, to me. Um, I don't think that's an accident. So it was, it's, we've really just had about a month uh, of, of awareness, and, and we've been sort of somewhat reeling from that news and trying to see, you know, is, is, is this real? Is, is, is this actually what's going to be the case? Uh, and, and when we basically ma made no progress uh, with, with, this, with discussions um, with the Air Force, we felt we had no choice but to file the, the protest. Oh, launch pad. So, uh, well, and our primary launch lo location is, uh, is Florida with uh, Cape Canaveral. Uh, so we've got a, a, a pad 40 at, uh, on the Cape Canaveral side and then pad 39A on the NASA side. Um, and we're, we're actually building out 39A uh, with the ability to do the, the Falcon Heavy. So the pr probably the first Falcon Heavy launch will be out of the 39A pad, which is really an amazing pad with incredible history. It's where Apollo 11 launched from. So I think that's, that's uh, you know, we for the foreseeable future, we expect uh, 
um, most of our launch activity to go out of the Cape Canaveral, Cape Kennedy area. Um, we're, we're also developing a launch pad in, on the south coast of Texas near Brownsville, uh, and we're waiting on the final environmental approvals for that. We expect to get those soon, uh, and we'll probably have uh, that site active in a couple of years. Um, and then of course, we've got our site at Vanderbilt Air Force Base in California for uh, polar launches. And as a rough guess, um, I think we'll have um, the NASA flights will tend to go out of 39A uh, uh, Air Force intelligence flights out of Pad 40, uh, commercial uh, GTO flights or geosynchronous flights out of the, the Brownsville location, and then, and then all polar flights governing commercial out of Vanderbilt. That seems like the logical breakdown. Hi, no, Dana Hughes, ABC News. Um, you mentioned ULA's continued use of Russian engines. Yes. Are you arguing why use Russian engines at all? Um, I, I, I do think it's very questionable, particularly in light of uh, international events. Yeah. It, does, it, it seems like the wrong time to send hundreds of millions of dollars to the Kremlin. Thank you. All right, thanks, everyone. Sure, Alan, what's up? Are, are you asking uh, the uh, Air Force to kind of hold up and wait until you're able to get formally certified? Yeah, I think the right thing to do would be to cancel the... the oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the, um, the reasonable thing to do would be to cancel the 36 core contract, um, wait a few months for certification to complete, then, then conduct a full competition. Mm -hmm. I think that would be in the best interest of the American public by, you know, not not by a small margin, but by a huge one. Well, would stop other competitors potentially from asking for the same courtesy? Um, well, I, I, I think they, they should. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank All right. you.